McConnell. I talked to Peter. We had someone in. About what? Mitch McConnell. Um, I talked to a senator who talked to, who talked to a Republican senator. I forget who it was now. But anyhow, he told me that Mitch McConnell told him, he said, look, our problem is not these cabinet secretaries. Our problem are these 1,400 positions that haven't been filled. So my point is that dust is, dust is collecting all of those offices around Washington. Now dust is collecting in US, 46 U.S. attorney's office offices all around the country. Uh, it has been a bad weekend. Bad weekend for the country, bad weekend for the Trump White House. Maybe the only um, kind of refreshing, entertaining part of the weekend again was SNL. SNL. Alec Baldwin back as uh, Donald Trump uh, with uh, an alien invasion. <laughs> Sir, where are you getting this information? From a very reputable source. What, the FBI, the CIA? InfoWars, it's a radio show hosted by Alex Jones. You know he's legit because he's always taking off his shirt, okay? And that is why I hereby demand, sorry, I hereby bedand, sorry, I hereby debate, sorry, by Gigi Hadid, that we watch. <laughs> That's where he gets his information. Look, this whole thing about Barack Obama tapping his phones. Where did that come from? It came from that lunatic Mark Levin, radio yeah. talk show host, right? Yeah. Picked up by Breitbart. Donald Trump hears it, and he comes out and tweets on it. That was a week ago Saturday. And by the way, that has not gone away. The white, for whole, all last week, Donald Trump didn't even talk, wouldn't even talk to reporters, wouldn't even take one question because he knew the first thing we were going to ask him about was what's your evidence that Barack Obama tapped your phones? And nobody, and so the White House, ignoring it, they think it's going to go away. John McCain put the nail in that coffin, I thought, yesterday when he said, no, 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 they've got to do something about this. It is not going to go away, and he's either got to put up or shut up. The president has one of two choices, either retract or to provide the information that the American people deserve, because if his predecessor violated the law, President Obama violated the law, we've got a serious issue here, to say the least. We got, yep. And you know what? That's, that's our job in the media, too, is keep demanding an answer for that. Either the president has to apologize for what he, what he accused President Obama of, or show the evidence. And there isn't any evidence, because it never happened. We're going to take a quick break. Alan Pike will join us. Alan Pike from Think Progress, Deputy Economic Policy Editor. Continuing here on this Monday, March 13th, with the Bill Press Show. Stay with us. Hey, fans, what do you say? A little time out here to talk about free speech TV. Look at this. Headline, front page, New York Times. Liberals tune in to TV again in search of communal solace. Yes, indeed, it's happening. Uh, progressives, liberals around the country... They need, they need to find the people who agree with them. They need to get the truth uh, instead of all the fake news coming out of the White House. And who are they turning to? They're turning to their liberal friends, progressive friends on television, to Rachel Maddow on uh, MSNBC and others there, to Bill Maher on HBO, to Stephen Colbert to, and uh, The Daily Show. Yes, indeed. And to Free Speech TV, most of all, Free Speech TV. You can get one show occasionally on those other channels, but the only 24-7 progressive television channel in the entire country is right here on Free Speech TV with me and, uh, um, and you know Tom Hartman, Stephanie Miller, David Packman, all your other great hosts. So what's that mean? Now's the time to step up and support Free Speech TV. We ask you to do that several times a year. Now's the time again to keep this great team going. We'll give you the best progressive news and insights every single day, every single show. Uh, and we depend on you to stay on the air. It's as simple as that because we're so independent. We're so freewheeling. We don't get any government money. We don't get any corporate money, no Koch Brothers money. It all depends on you. And if you can help us, we'll send you a little token of our appreciation for 60 bucks, a free speech TV water bottle for a pledge of 120 bucks. 
this great new book called The Revolution Where You Live by Sarah Van Gelder, her stories of her travels across America. For a pledge of 150 bucks, a great new DVD on that Standing Rock uh, revolution uh, out there to stop that pipeline. For a pledge of 240 you get the DVD, the water bottle, a t- free speech TV grocery bag, and a bumper sticker for $360 pledge that uh, the book, Revolution Where You Live, the grocery bag, the t- free speech TV hat, a hand fan, and a bumper sticker, the whole enchilada. For 1000 bucks. get yourself to Washington. Carol and I will take you out to dinner and meet the whole team here and be part of the Bill Press Show. Make your pledge right now, 877-378-8669. Call our standing, uh, recep, recep, reception is standing by to take your calls, 877-378-8669. Or go online and make your pledge right now for Free Speech TV at freespeech.org. Same great show, new great channel. Stream live video at youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show. Here we go now, the Bill Press Show on this Monday, March 13. We're coming to you live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., which is just a hornet's nest right now. Republicans fighting Republicans over the health care plan put forward by Paul Ryan and embraced by Donald Trump. Why? We still can't figure that out. Uh, But we're getting to the bottom of it. Brought to you today by the Laborers International Union of North America, or LIUNA. We all have uh, better, we live better because of the America they are building, building a better America. That's their website, liunabuildsamerica.org. Check it out. And we salute the good men men and women of the Laborers Union under President Terry O'Sullivan. Thank them for their support of the uh, program Alan Pike joins us from uh, Think Progress, the great Think Progress at the Center for American Progress, thinkprogress.org. Alan, so much to talk about. I want to talk about somebody that we haven't heard much about. You've been writing about. Um, we know Donald Trump had to go back to the well to get a number two candidate yeah. for labor secretary. Yeah. That's Alex probably not the, how he wants to be referred to uh, as the number two candidate. But, but um, he is. But that's the, he that's is, the fact. right? Yeah. yeah. So what's the deal with yeah. him? Alex, is Alex Acosta is his name, um, and he's got a long track record of public service, very different uh, profile from Andy Puzder, the guy who he's filling in for, um, fast food CEO who decided he didn't want to uh, take the heat of going through confirmation hearings and because pulled his he name. Because he knew it, exactly. He Wasn't going so lose. good for him. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> turns out he's got a bunch of skeletons in his closet, uh, several of them involving uh, domestic abuse allegations with his ex-wife. So, yeah. Ugly stuff. Um, Alex Costa cuts a, a very different figure, uh, on, on paper at least, and we don't uh, as yet have a hearing scheduled for him, so it remains to be seen how Democrats will approach it. But the, the early indications, at least from um, major heavy hitter types in the labor movement, seems to be uh, sort of optimistic toward this new guy. Who is um, he? He is a uh, – most recently he's been running the law school at Florida International University. Down in Florida for the last, I believe, five or six years. Before that, he was uh, a federal prosecutor down in Florida for the Southern District of Miami. And prior to that, he served in a couple different jobs for uh, President George W. Bush. And the, 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 that, that's really the, the meat of his resume for, for the purposes of this new position at the Department of Labor. Um, one of those, he was on the National Labor Relations Board under Bush for about eight months. Um, and to my mind, more importantly... He was at the Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division, which is a crucial agency within the DOJ, um, for a three-year period, two-and-a-half, three-year period um, that's really critical for some complicated reasons, but it's really critical to understanding what the Bush Justice Department did, specifically around um, voting rights and efforts to suppress the vote of uh, parts of the population that are perceived to skew Democratic. Uh, And didn't I read that when he was U.S. Attorney, um, he prosecuted Jack Abramoff? He did, yeah. He, he's had a couple of, of high-profile prosecutions. He prosecuted Abramoff. He prosecuted a couple of 
um, major drug cases. He was also the prosecutor in charge uh, when uh, Jeffrey Epstein's um, allegations of uh, uh, op basically operating a underage sex ring of some kind um, came up, and and uh, he had to he had to make decision about how to handle that case. Um, and that's a whole hornet's nest that that touches on uh, Donald Trump and and on the Clintons in some in some messy ways. So I, I'll I'll be surprised if Democrats try to interrogate that part of his record all that heavily. Um, it's really it's his time. It's this couple of years in the early two thousands when he was here in D.C. working for mm -hmm. uh, President Bush in a couple of different capacities that that get pretty interesting. Um, if people remember, this is it's wild that this stuff feels like ancient history already um, at this point, but. Uh, People remember all the way back in 2003 to 2005 or so, the Justice Department uh, effectively hollowed out the Civil Rights Division. A guy named Brad Schlotzman, who had been appointed to uh, a junior position in the in the DOJ, uh, made it his mission to hire people who uh, he would consider sort of right-thinking Americans, uh, quote unquote, real Americans. Basically, people who didn't believe in the mission of the Civil Rights Division, who didn't. Uh, want to use the the force of the federal law enforcement uh, agencies to protect voting rights, to vindicate voting rights, to make sure as many people as possible could vote, um, to protect people from irresponsible police, all the things that the Civil Rights Division uh, did uh, vigorously under President Obama. Uh, when President Obama came in, his DOJ team had to sort of uh, rebuild, huh? boost, yeah, yeah, pick pick up and dust off this agency because Bush's people had so effectively sabotaged it, and Acosta was uh, Schlossman's boss at the time that all that was happening. And there's reason to believe that he either did know or certainly should have known um, what was happening on his watch. He was yeah. never directly implicated or held responsible in the investigation of what happened. Uh, but it's that sort of classic manager's dilemma. Either you had no idea what was happening right under your nose, and so you're sort of incompetent, uh, or you did know, and you were a willful participant in it somehow. All right, so uh, let's move on. What happens to the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department under Attorney General Jeff Sessions? That's the $64,000 question. It's, uh, it's not going to be good. We know that. Uh, we can conjecture that safely. So, yeah, the, the, the variety of ways in which uh, Jeff Sessions' ideology is going Excuse to start me, to Jefferson influence. Sessions. Jefferson, Jefferson, Jefferson Beauregard, Beauregard, Beauregard Sessions. 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 Uh, his, his philosophical uh, approach to this job is going to wreak havoc in a lot of people's lives in a lot of different ways. The Civil Rights Division is going to be really at the core of that for some of the things that have been prominent in our news. Does voting rights come under years. the civil rights yep. section? Yep, voting yep. rights. So and, they've already um, shown they've pulled out of this one case in Texas. Right, right. And and they've said that they're uh, they're not going to defend the the CFPB in a lawsuit over the uh, whether their uh, structure is constitutional. There's so many things that Jeff Sessions has an opportunity to do now uh, that are going to screw with people in various ways. The CRD stuff is going to be front and center to uh, reporters who are the Civil Rights Division. Um, is going to be Thank one you. of the one of the sort of top line things that reporters who are focusing on Jeff Sessions and the Department of Justice uh, look to to gauge just how quickly he's going to try to roll back um, progress made on a variety of things under President Obama and in particular uh, the the federal government's role in oversight of local police agencies is going to be a big part of that. Sessions has already indicated that he doesn't really believe philosophically in the idea that uh, you should. Uh, investigate whole police departments when there are incidents that make the news that you should treat those instead as, as so one Ferg and bad apples. Ferguson, Chicago, uh, right, investigated right. Leave by the, the leave it to the locals. And, and, and we've and, seen how well that works. Right. And and that's the thing. And and, and yeah. what the Obama administration did in, in reinvigorating those kinds of investigations is to really use the convening power of the federal government to get local cops and, you know, uh, cl clergy and uh, civic leaders and elected officials all to sit down in rooms and talk to each other uh, and talk to their public in a way that um, is just there isn't much incentive to do necessarily without uh, the kind of spotlight that the DOJ brings to to local communities. And some places will do that stuff and some places won't. But um, but if you if you pull back from um, that idea that the federal government has a, a proper role to play there. You're going to get. Uh, you're going to. You're going to reduce the likelihood that you see progress on uh, police reform in a lot of places. And there are twenty, fifteen, or twenty cities that are still operating under consent decrees struck under the Obama administration. And Sessions will have an opportunity to um, sort of passively erode the enforcement of those if he chooses. Oh to. yeah, he'll walk away from every one of those. 
I so one that. thing that we know about Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, yes sir, is, yes sir, is that he is a man of his word. I mean, when he tells you something, you can take it to the bank, um, and that's what the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, right. Manhattan, discovered. Yeah, Pete Bahara, uh, Jeff Sessions called him uh, during the campaign and or uh, when the, during the transition, uh, and said, "You're doing such a great job in New York, and I've talked to the president, and we both." Want you to stay on the job, right? We want to keep you on the job. Uh, that was then, and then this is now. Friday. Yep, about four forty-five in the afternoon on he Friday. He gets a call saying, "Submit yep. your resignation. You're out." Yeah, and 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 this is one of the stories what, where what, people, I think, the headline was, you know, Jeff Sessions fires all the U.S. attorneys, and that in and of itself uh, is, I, from what I can understand, pretty standard. That new president, you you ask all the sitting, pretty much all the sitting federal prosecutors to tender their resignations, and you know, you you decide who you want to rehire. You ask cabinet members, and you ask right um, ambassadors, basically right. all to submit right. their resignations. Yeah, that's the meat of but of being president. With the U.S. Right? attorneys, people. usually you set you you arrange for some kind of a transition. Yeah, yeah, right. Because there's active casework. There's right. Yeah. There's a job to be done. And 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 it was interesting, as you say, it was interesting to uh, in the first place for them to have told Pre Ferrara, uh, "We want you to stay on," um, because that's such a ho- high profile um, job within the the U.S. attorneys sort of constellation. That's a, a very bright star. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of high-profile uh, financial industry cases uh, that that are based in that jurisdiction. Um, the, the Trump organization, the is sheriff of Wall Street, they call right, them. Yeah. Right, yeah, very important job, and uh, and yeah, and it, you can you can look at that to, at Sessions changing his mind and firing Barara anyway. Um, you can look at it a couple different ways. The the most obvious to me, the simplest explanation to me is. This is another example of this administration doing a favor for the the groups and the companies that Trump has spent much of his career hobnobbing with. Um, you know, the, the uh, it's a it's a, a, a Who more don't like Bahara because he of, was he was after them all the yeah, time. Yeah. Goldman Sachs he was, and he was all the hedge funds tough. and all the rest. He was, right. Yeah. Right. And 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 in in a funny way, the um, that sort of sheriff of Wall Street uh, idea. Uh, that that branding got got more credible in the last couple of years, in part because so much of the best casework that uh, that did happen coming out of the financial crisis was initiated through that office, um, rather than through any of the other agencies here in Washington tasked with oversight right. of the industry. Right. So right. It, it ended up being a very busy place. So um, and and they're going to continue to have uh, a lot of. Uh, hard decisions to make about you know what cases to pursue and what to drop, and some of them will likely end up involving um, some of Trump's own corporate holdings. Well, um, you, you, first of all, I, I want you to complete your thought. You said there were two possible scenarios here. One is that his uh, his buddies on Wall Street said you got to get rid of this guy. So yeah. That's oh why. yeah. What, yeah. What's and, the and second scenario? The other the other is that um, my understanding is that is that Barrara had taken up an investigation. Um, at the request of Mayor Bill de Blasio, um, of something to do with Trump's finances. That's I believe, what I, I want to get to because to Elijah get to Cummings, returns. Congressman Elijah Cummings, uh, d- ranking Democrat on the uh, uh, mm-hmm. House Oversight Committee, has suggested uh, the same thing that this may be Trump getting a guy off his back. Here's uh, Congressman Cummings. There's a lot of questions coming up as to whether uh, Mr. Trump is, President Trump is concerned about the jurisdiction of uh, this U.S. attorney uh, and whether that might affect his future. Yeah, or his right might, might yeah. affect his own empire. Yeah. So, right, and and if you can any validity to that, I I suspect that there is. I mean, if if you uh, th- this is a relatively new investigation, you can probably um, you probably don't have to worry too much about appearing to be tinkering with somebody's. Uh, who's investigating you? Because again, it's sort of the fundamental prerogative of the president to um, to hire his own people in jobs like these uh, as he, as he moves into into power. Um, but yeah, it, it it seems likely to me that part of what's going on there is um, well, this guy's got a reputation for efficient and uh, meticulous. Uh, prosecution work, and and, investigative work, and, and tough. I'm one of the people <laughs> on the wrong end of that right now. So yeah. let's see if we can find somebody else. So what happens? All these offices in the meantime, uh, presumably they have someone who's stepping into an acting uh, U.S. attorney role. Um, one of their deputies uh, will will take on the day to day 
for the time being. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how quickly Sessions can roll out uh, a new list of U.S. attorneys. I, that, that tends to, in the past historically, has been a sort of relatively frictionless part of the, uh, the, the presidential power to appoint people. I don't know that we're going to see many frictionless nominations uh, anywhere in government for the next couple of years. And as I think you guys were talking about before I got here, the the general slowness with which this administration has approached oh, staffing yeah. matters yeah. across yeah. the government uh, is going to start to wreak havoc on a bunch of the sort of paper pusher offices that people rely on, whether or not they they see it every day. And and I think you'll they risk. Uh, having examples of that same kind of um, unnecessary friction in the bureaucratic process, except yeah. when it's prosecutors, then you're talking about criminal trials, then you're talking about right. much right. grabbier things. You've, you've got a potential for it, all it takes is you know one the one parent of a murdered child to to go in front of a camera and um, you know say what what happened here. You're screwing with you know justice for my son or daughter or whatever. Right. And, no, and so you got is, a scandal. So they'll have part, to move pretty quick. Part of a pattern. I was referencing this. Um, a front page article in the New York Times just above the fold uh, about dust piling up in all these key offices. Just, right. just, just listen to the first couple of sentences. At the State Department, the normally pulsating hub of executive offices is hushed and virtually empty. At the Pentagon, military missions in some of the world's most troubled places are re being run by a defense secretary who has none of his top team in place. And it goes on across uh, uh, Treasury, Commerce, Health and Human Services, yeah. every agency, yeah, just empty, empty offices. Yeah, it's nobody. It's not. It's not right that Democrats have blocked these nominations right. in the they, Congress. They haven't made them. They yeah. have not made the well, nomination. And, and you and I are old enough to remember when the conservative pipe dream was to uh, make government small enough that you could drown it in the bathtub. Right, the old the old Grover Norquist scheme. Even even that crowd. Um, they they acknowledge that well if, if we if the government is still uh, on the hook to do this thing today even though we don't like it then we should make sure there's somebody there to do it and we'll and we'll keep trying to pass the legislation to repeal you know whatever it is to repeal Medicare to to yeah. shrink Social Security whatever it is we want to do but in the meantime um, we'll fulfill the obligations of the government under the law and and this new crowd seems very content to um, just just sort of let things uh, wither on the vine. Peter Fenn, Democratic strategist, joins us for the next hour as a, as a friend of Bill. Alan Pike here now from uh, Think Progress. And Alan, you know, Washington's embroiled right now, particularly the Republican Party embroiled, in this battle over um, uh, a vehicle, <laughs> the Paul Ryan plan, to replace Obamacare. Um, what, what's, what's your reading on this? I know you've been writing particularly about, and hasn't gotten much attention, is that yeah, there are the changes to Obamacare. They keep some parts, they get rid of other parts, right. they put the tax credits in, they get rid of the subsidies. But Medicaid is maybe what's most affected by this whole plan. Isn't yeah, it? the 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 bill that they're uh, working on in the House right now would uh, slash Medicaid by like half a trillion dollars, trillion with a T, uh, over the next decade. Um, and half of that is it ends the Medicaid expansion under Obamacare, which... 31 states used uh, basically an offer of right. essentially free money from the government to expand your eligibility uh, requirements for Medicaid. And there were, what, 11 or 12 million had signed yeah, up? Yes, I'm like 11 that. million of the people who, who gained yeah. insurance coverage uh, overall from the Affordable Care Act right. got it through Medicaid expansion in those states. And uh, what they're proposing to do is to uh, end Medicaid expansion, um, freeze it, and, and yeah, and 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 set up this new funding formula for all of for the entire Medicaid system, um, and this the new funding formula would essentially assume that however many people you have enrolled at the start of 2020 in your state in Medicaid is the most that's the most that you'll ever have, um, and and that your enrollment figures should only go down. So we're only going to provide funding. Um, in 2021 and in 2025 and in 2039 um, based upon the number of people that you had enrolled in 2020. And so we'll take the number of people you had enrolled in 2020 and a figure that we've come up with that we think is a fair estimate of the one-year cost of insuring a single Medicaid recipient. Um, and we'll multiply the one by the other, and that's how much money you'll get every year forever, even if your enrollment numbers actually go up. So now uh, Medicaid— And even if your costs go up. Right. Right, right. So instead of being a program that actually pays for health care, 
that whatever right. whatever dollars you are you are forced yeah. to spend for services, Medicaid reimburses X percentage of those dollars. You would get a flat amount um, each year. Uh, regardless of what you actually spend, which is a recipe for bankrupting the program. It's, that, that's all a very complicated way to say. What they're trying to do here is destroy Medicaid. Medicaid would not continue to be a viable means of supplying access to health care for low-income families across this country if they do what they're proposing to do here. Right. And, and let's, let's remember, Medicaid, uh, there's Medicare and there's Medicaid, right? Right. Medicare is for everybody. Medicaid is the poorest and the most vulnerable right. of our population. Right. Correct? Yeah. Or covered. And there are today, is, am I correct, 68 million or something? Who yeah, are? I think I think north of that. Yeah, I think I think it's above 70 million with the expansion. Um, I believe there are some something like 60 million people uh, who are on Medicaid under the old eligibility rules and another 11 million who were able to get on thanks to the expanded eligibility rules in a number of states. So yeah, we're talking about uh, a solid like 20% of the country, uh, close to a quarter of the country. Right. And let's also remember that the, that uh, the, that Donald Trump, as candidate, said, unlike other Republicans, right, right? I am not going to touch Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security. Right? How can he support the Ryan bill? Because it doesn't. He doesn't care what he said before. Because he's not at all bound by his past <laughs> statements. Because he I has. Guess a, that's the answer. He has, oh, there has, is that. He has a more fluid relationship with the truth than than most politicians. <laughs> he has a, 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 a more of a, a he regards it as a variable concept. But the fact is, this is a this is the exact opposite of what he promised as a candidate. Right. 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 Absolutely. I mean, and and yeah. and and there will continue to be. He's going to run into that brick wall a, another half a dozen times this spring alone. I bet you. Uh, because Republicans have been uh, batting around ideas for cutting Social Security benefits, cutting Medicare benefits uh, in the same kind of complicated, it takes 10 minutes to explain how they're doing it way that, that we just talked about with Medicaid. They've got a whole raft of ideas for how to restrict the practical, functional value of these programs to human beings who rely on them without um, just putting it in the shop window. Hey, we're getting rid of Social Security. Right. And so what is it? What is it, you know, it's one thing to talk like at this level, but what does it mean in the real world for somebody today who's on Medicare? Medicaid, I'm sorry. It gets very scary very fast. And I, my, my, my parents are uh, right around Medicare age, one, one, one on either side of the, of the Medicare age. Um, so this stuff is, get, tend to break out in hives if I think about it too much. Um, but yeah, I, the, the, the level of, uh, economic harm that you can cause to a single family by yanking uh, their their health insurance coverage is is catastrophic, right? I mean, all it takes is one, um, not even one major illness. If say your kid gets really sick and you don't have the means to get them to the doctor, and that you know a one week cold turns into a three week cold, suddenly you've gotten fired from your job because you're trying to look after your sick kid for three weeks. You know that it's 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 this sort of um, constantly redoubling like sonic boom of economic harm um, that you cause to, and that's and that's at the individual family level. You start to stack up enough situations like that across uh, a, a complicated national economy, and pretty quickly you'll start to see um, some some bounce back effects, some some um, some splash back in macroeconomic figures, in in economic growth, in job creation. Um, you'll you'll start to drag down the broader <laughs> economy because Medicaid patients are like uh, one. I think it's one out of every six dollars that that the United States of America spends on oh, healthcare yeah. right. services each year nationwide of any type, from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor. One dollar out of every six is spent by Medicaid. It's a huge, huge, huge part of our healthcare economy, which is itself like a sixth of our national economy. So you can't. It's 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 too big of a pillar to just start kicking at it without. Some, something's going to fall and hit you on the head. Right. And isn't the reality also, so they're going to say, let's say 2020, we're going to have this new funding mechanism. We're going to, we're going to come up with a number right. per Medicaid patient right. and, and the, uh, to the states, and that's what you get. Right. right. You tell us how many people you have on a Medicaid, and we'll multiply that by yeah. whatever that number is. That's the number you get. Yep. Uh, a couple things wrong with that, I, it seems to me. Number one, that's the same number for every single state. Right. Right. And healthcare costs a lot more in right. New York than right. it does in maybe Nebraska. Yeah, I don't know. Right. So there's an inequity already, right. already right. there. Secondly, the states could spend this money for anything. 
Couldn't well, they? Th- Do they have to of, spend it for Medicaid? With this, with with the the specific nature of the proposal that they've got in this House bill, they would have to keep spending it on Medicaid. There's there's this other thing that they've been talking about doing for years called block granting. Block. Okay. That's, that's similar uh, in character um, in, but, in the broad brushstrokes, but would yeah would have the flexibility to start rating the Medicaid budget. Yeah. Uh, the big question is whether these cuts will be seen. Uh, enough to have an impact on 2018 in the midterm elections. Um, I think Republicans hope not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Alan, you're doing good work, man. Good reporting there. Always good to see you, Bill. Check him out at thinkprogress.org. Alan Pike and all of his good friends, thanks for coming in. Always a pleasure. Peter Fett. This He's next. is the Bill Press Show. Taught him how to hit a baseball. Just like that. That hurt! How to hit a receiver. Nice. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. Fight the Trump administration. This is the Bill Press Show. Live at youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show. March Madness on its way. Yeah, nothing to do with basketball. It's all about a blizzard, believe it or not. Yeah, we waited until the middle of March to have our first snowstorm in Washington. Uh, it's due here. Slam the East Coast starting uh, late tonight or early tomorrow. Hello, everybody. What do you say? This is the Bill Press Show, and it's good to see you. On a Monday, hope you had a uh, good weekend, a little time to uh, bounce back and visit with friends and family and recharge your batteries. And there is lots to talk about today. Indeed, uh, President Trump and Jeff Sessions taking the wha- taking the axe to 46 U.S. attorneys all at one time. Donald Trump taking credit for the great Barack Obama job numbers that he inherited And uh, House Republicans still look like they are intent on walking the plank on health care, despite the warnings from some Senate Republicans. Lots to talk about, and uh, we need a lot of help to get through it all. So we got him. Peter Fenn, Democratic (laughs) strategist, uh, here in studio with us for the entire hour as a friend of Bill. He'll sort it all out for us. Hello, Peter. Hello, Bill. How are you doing? Great to be here. I know. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. I know it. I know it. I can say Happy New Year, but it's not so happy, and it's not the New Year anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. Wrong on both. So we'll get to all of the news of the day with your calls and, I mean, your comments on Twitter. At BP Show, let us know what you think about all the stories of the day. But first, this is the Full Court Press. Yes, indeed. Just a couple of the stories making news. This I find to be fascinating. A company called Transit Center, it's a research and advocacy group in New York, took a look at public transit, who's using it, how much we're using it. And it turns out that last year, nationwide, public transit actually took a dip. 0.3%. Uber. No. Uber. No. They actually point to one very specific piece of the equation here as to why people are taking less transit. Rats. Working from home. The Washington, D.C. metro system was so bad last year and so many people stopped using it that it has dragged down national ridership figures. Every other metropolitan area with a with a subway system or a transit system went up, except for Washington D.C. 
14% dip in ridership last year, and that was enough to bring down the national average. Everywhere else was up. D.C. was down. And, but down and by that's s- why we have gridlock here in Washington. That's <laughs> it, man. <laughs> How'd you get here this morning? I drove, man. I always have to leave very early to get <laughs> <Yeah>. here. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, live in D.C. Right. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, I just got to say, I, we had some problems last year, but I use the Metro all the time. It's a great system. I use it. No, it's not. Yes, it, is it is not a great I'm sorry. system. It it's is falling apart. System. Oh, oh they're, shut they're up. They're you live in Rockville. <laughs> yeah, right. I also oh, take yeah. the Metro and can read a newspaper when they say that things are catching on fire. We haven't done anything for the infrastructure for the Metro in years and years and years. Well, I, I'm working, with Bill. I'm a Metro loyalist. Right now? It is a great system. Too. It's a great system. In so theory. Is and stop dumping on it. When you move into D.C., you can you can talk, but not if you live in Okay, so if you live outside of D.C., would they have Metro stops outside? Side of DC, don't use those. I'm gonna cut your mic. Jesus, you're wrong. What's your next story? He's talking a lot louder lately. What? What? What's going on with this guy? He's screaming. <laughs> I'm not screaming. I just, I, I'm just saying. <laughs> Next story. The NCAA put out their tournament bracket yesterday afternoon, and we now have. Okay, lower the voice level a little bit. <laughs> We're all gonna go deaf. In here, <laughs> maybe we already are deaf. I'll let okay. you finish. Right, you finish up. Yeah. The NCAA put out their brackets yesterday. Yeah. Number ones are Gonzaga, oh. North Carolina, Villanova, and Kansas. By the way, that's all I got. Why haven't we done our brackets this year? Because they just came out yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah, they came out last night. No, seriously, yeah. I haven't heard anything about. You know, normally, we make a. Yeah, I just made a big, big thing about it. You told me to shut up. <laughs> so if you want a bracket, do a bracket. I don't care what you talk uh, about. I'm done. <laughs> and this president won't do a bracket. Great. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. Hey, here we go on a Monday, Monday, March 13. Um, all friends and neighbors here on the Bill Press Show. <laughs> uh, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, whether you're watching on our video stream, youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show, we mind you again. Got to be a full member of the team, so uh, not, not, don't just go there, but subscribe, sign up, and you'll hear from us several times during the day and be glad that you did with updates. Uh, you can also, uh, of course, we're joining you on Free Speech TV. And on the great WCPT out in Chicagoland, Peter Fenn is here for the entire hour as a friend of Bill, which uh, with uh, so much to talk about as we uh, settle around the table here in our studio on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. All right, Peter, what? where do we start? God, I'm telling you. Um, yeah, right? Let's just start. Where We have a new Democratic chairman right now. Okay? What? Shape is the Democratic Party in today. Well, you know, I'll tell you, when you look at what's happened over the last eight years, resounding victory of Barack Obama in 2008, everybody's upbeat. Then we begin that we we had almost two thirds of the state legislative seats in 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 2008. Yeah. They have about two thirds of the state legislative seats now, and the governors. It's you know we're in trouble. I mean, we are in serious trouble. And the only way we get out of trouble, which we will, is we work our asses off at the state and local level and start electing folks. There's a great group out of Chicago called RISE. They've got an app now where you can find out every single local election in your area. They're putting this together so people are going to, you know, hopefully register turnout to vote. And by the time we get to 2018 and 2020, we've begun to put this thing back together again. And the other thing we have to do, Bill, look, we're pansies. The Democrats are pansies. I mean, we got to fight back. We can't put our little, wet our fingers, put them up to the political winds and play games anymore. We have to be tough. And one of the things I think we learned from this past campaign and from Bernie's campaign and from the folks out there like Elizabeth Warren is, you got to stand for something. And you got to go after the other guys. I mean, you know, Larry Klayman had his, had his go after Hillary operate for 25 years, spending $45 million a year. We've got zip. 
on that level. We have to be a lot tougher. We need good, solid lawyers. We need good research. We're going to file lawsuits against these guys. We have to question them on their ethics. And we basically have to question them on their insane policies, which which will drive our country into total bankruptcy if we let them do it. Uh, Carolyn Fiddler, too, is going to be joining us at the half hour uh, from the De- Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. We'll talk particularly with her about, about governor's races uh, and about um, legislative races, because if you don't start there, we're screwed, right? No. I mean, that's where you and I got our start. Never get yeah. the house back, for sure. No, because you got to redistrict this mess. I mean, I'm off for a fair redistricting process. I think gerrymandering's horrible. I think we got to do it fairly like they do in Iowa and, and the new approach in California. But you know something? If they're not going to play that game, then to hell with them. We, you know, we go, we do what, just what they did to us. We redistrict these states after we take over the state houses and the governorships. Let me, can I ask you a question? Because I, I think that we, we have a very clear divide in the party, right? And, you, and, it, and I think it all goes back to the primary between Hillary and Bernie. And I think that you have a group of people who are way more progressive, borderline Democrat, so Democratic socialists, that say Bernie would have won this election. And then you have people who say, well, Hillary did win this election and she did nothing wrong and that we don't have to change the way that we talk to rural voters or anything like that because Hillary won by nearly three million votes. So th- there are two paths in the road here. Well, look, the fact is that we win the coasts. Yeah. We, we cleaned up in California. Our th- her three million votes, or close to it, came mostly from you know, the, the coast and, mm-hmm. and heavily from California. Yeah. we got to win the heartland. Look, the, uh, Stan Greenberg, who did the famous stuff in the 80s on the Reagan Democrats, just did a series of focus groups back in Macomb, Michigan. And he sat there with, and I just read it over the weekend, he, just, he sat there with folks who had voted at least once for Obama, they were Democrats, independents, independent-leaning Democrats. He didn't, he didn't sit there with hardcore Republicans because he knew what he was going to get. And he put them together. And I'll tell you, the scariest part of that to me is we haven't been connecting with those people. Bernie did connect with him with his message. Hillary had real trouble connecting with her message with them. But the Democratic Party, if the Democratic Party doesn't stand for working people, what in the hell do we stand That's for? That's it. If the Democratic Party doesn't stand for a clean environment, what the hell do we stand for? If the Democratic Party can't help voters in Flint, Michigan, with their problem, you know, where are we? And, you know, it seems to me that, that we let that go. You know, we really didn't hit hard enough on connecting with people who have been struggling for the last 15 years. And, and, and we talked some talk. We had, look, programmatically. What Hillary had, and, and Bernie too, they had terrific programs on education, you know, on, on, on minimum wage. Every state that has put the minimum wage on the ballot in the last three cycles has passed it. So why weren't we talking more about it? That, to me, is the basic point of this. And that's yeah. why, you know, you let the middle of America go, you're screwed. Yeah. I, but just to back up on that point, I think there's so much stuff about talking to middle America and talking to those voters that Democrats wrote that language. They just forgot how to speak it. Right. And that, I think, is the bigger problem. And look, when you're out of power, it's so much easier to, to, to bitch and moan and complain. Sure. To, you know, Obama, you know like Trump is going to have people in today who are going to bitch about the o- Obamacare. I mean, come on. Give me a friggin' break. <laughs> you know, why don't you talk about what your solution is, jackass? I mean, <laughs> you have not put forth before the American people, you know, anything that's workable. You're going to knock 10 to 15 million people off of this. You're going to send them to the streets. You know, Ronald Reagan talked a good game about the city on a hill. When do we start having the homeless problem in America with Ronald Reagan? Because he kicked people off. This is what's going to happen. He's going to kick. And those people who voted for him, who had, you know, keep keep uh, your government hands off my uh, Affordable Care Act. Hello, or Medicare. They would have said before. Right. They're going to start saying, oh, wait a second. What am I? Have I been sold a bill of goods here? Is this guy the the P. T. Barnum of, of of the modern era? And I think, you know, if if we do our job right and we and we, you know, play the backbencher, we start winning elections. You know, we have a message that works and it penetrates. Well we got we got two big elections this year. This year. Right. Governor of Virginia, right. governor of New Jersey. Right. Right. Absolutely. And you know, you've got one of the most unpopular governors in New Jersey. We should we should win that one. 
This one we should hold. I mean, I don't know whether it's going to be Northam or Perillo, but we should hold that race. In, I mean, in, in uh, Virginia. In, in Virginia. We should win. It's becoming more of a democratic state. We should win those races. We start winning these races, and we will if we do things right. I mean, that, you know, the whole thing about panic, panic, panic. Look, right. the pendulum swings. You know, we've been in this so often. Oh, I remember. One minute the Democrat Party's dead, then the Republican <laughs> Party's dead, and then they're yeah. oh, come yeah. on. It wasn't that long ago that everybody was writing, writing off the Republican Party as dead. In fact, yeah. even this year, people, we, we were all writing off the Democratic right, Party before and, November 8th. And by the way, the Democrats, party, and by the way, the Democrats do have a problem here. They have to sort of figure some stuff out. I still think, and I know it's hard to say this when the Republicans have the White House, the, the House and the Senate. I think Republicans have a much bigger problem that they just haven't faced yet. You know, it's coming down the line here. Look, that they're going to re- they're going to have a much bigger problem with their party in another Peter, couple of years. They are not known as the governing party for a reason right, right, because right. they don't govern. They don't right. govern very well. Right, right, when right. they do, we have to clean up their mess. We had to clean up the, the George W. Bush mess when it came to Iraq, Afghanistan, the budget issues. We had to clean up. Look. When, when Bill Clinton came into office, the, 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 you know, the deficit was rising, things, the recession was hitting. He had to make some tough choices, just like Obama had to make tough choices. I mean, I'm getting a little tired of cleaning up the Republicans' mess, to be perfectly honest with you. But, you know, this is, you know, they will, you know, they're, they're digging their own graves and they keep digging. And, and for us to say, oh, we're going to compromise on everything. Look, if we can compromise, work with them on something great, terrific. Maybe there's some infrastructure stuff we can do. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cave in any of this. This business of, you know, there's a new health care bill that's going to come out of the Senate that Democrats should support. Come on, you show it to me. Yeah. I mean, you show it to me. All right. Peter Fenn with his Democratic strategist uh, for the, here as a uh, friend of Bill. So uh, it's been, what's today, like 54, 55, right? Uh, Friday was 50, so go figure. Uh, of the Donald Trump presidency, um, what's your take so far? Oh, I, I think it's been an unmitigated disaster. I mean, I think this is a guy who who has really no clue what he's doing. He's got Steve Bannon uh, pulling the strings behind him, who really doesn't have a clue what he's doing either, except that he kind of knows what he wants to do. And, you know, they're talking 37% cut in our State Department. Really? Are you going to do that? 20% cut in EPA. Really? Are you going to do that? You know, eviscerate. You know, he's talking about the terrible problems in the inner cities. So what, is, what does he say about HUD? He says, oh, we're not going to give you any more money to repair your toilets and water systems. Well, we're not going to give you any money for food. We're not going to build any more housing for poor people. They're cutting the HUD budget by, what, 10, 15, or hundred? Yeah, it's, more, it's, it's, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Almost 20 percent they're talking there, too. Uh, well, they can't do it. I don't think the Congress is going to let them do it. But And the other part of this bill, it seems to me, is, you know, and I'm being pretty histrionic this morning. But, you know. We it, like it. Yeah. No, no, yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. But, I mean, I no, think, you know, you had like a guy in, 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 in Barack Obama who was unbelievably competent, um, unbelievably cool under pressure. I mean, you know, who, who came and took. Who got the mess? Who inherited the mess? Right. Are you kidding yeah. me? This guy inherited 235,000 jobs last yeah. month. That's what he inherited. Obama came in and he inherited 800,000 job loss in February of, of 2009. So the mess that we're gotten out of, the reason we're not having 10% unemployment but 47 4. is because of the policies of Barack Obama. Of course. Right. So, you know, I think this guy is going to get us into more of a mess and we're going to have to get us Dang out of it out. again. Yeah, no, I mean, you're it's, right. Plus, the guy's unstable. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, now even, you know, John McCain over the weekend said, hey, look, come on with this business of wiretapping you at Trump Tower. My attitude on this, put up or shut up. I'm not saying that to the president of the United States. Put up or shut up. You know, you got something, show it. Yeah. He doesn't have Jack, <laughs> and he and he knows he doesn't have Jack. He he is he he goes on. He watches some TV show, and then he, you no, know, I mean he might as well well you know be be, be and this is Mister Mister uh, uh, you know fiction president yeah. here. Yeah, I mean he doesn't have a clue what he's doing, and he starts yelling at people. He starts you know you can't come on my plane to Florida. Oh come on, <laughs> come on. jeez, <laughs> <laughs> woo, yeah. So um, it really does. It really is aggravating. Oh, it, it, you know, and that's not a president. That, this guy isn't a. That's what it comes. The key down to. thing, you know, David Gergen well, was speaking to 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 the, the group of foreign policy folks in New York a few weeks ago. He said, "Look, do not treat this." 
presidency as normal. Yeah. Do not you treat can't. this man as a normal president. And I don't mean, you know, not normal in a good sense. This guy is, if once you start doing that and you, you start reporting on him as a normal person, you got a problem. But mm-hmm. everybody, everybody says, you know, oh, well, I'm so, you know, it's, he's so bad I'm starting to miss George W. Bush. Let's not forget George W. Bush was a war criminal who start, you know what I mean? And like, yes, that's fair. Maybe George Bush was more of a statesman than Donald Trump. And that it really says something about how bad Trump is. And he's a hell of a good painter. <laughs> Bush is a good painter. That's a good uh, point. So the question I keep getting asked is, uh, can Donald Trump last four years? Well, you know, I think we got three ways that he goes. The first way is he's eating much too much Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> and, and McDonald's hamburgers and getting no exercise and finding, hey, gee, this job is a little bit high pressure. And he blows an aorta. I mean, you know, this is not a nice thing to say about a president of the United States, but this – don't, don't give me that. He's a healthy guy. He's not a very healthy guy. So that's not inconceivable. The 25th Amendment that everybody's talking about, obviously you have to have a situation where the Republicans make that happen. If they become, if he does, if, if if he does something increasingly crazy, they go to Pence and say, "Hey, you know, we, this is too dangerous. We got something happens in North with North Korea. He sends a missile over there. He, you know, he sends troops. And who the heck knows what he does? But he creates some kind of crazy situation. They say there's a real serious question about his stability. And and you've got you've got the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, you know, basically mm-hmm. saying, uh, I don't yeah. think so. Okay, so that's that's the second way. And, you know, the third way to me is Russia. I mean, if this uh, – look, Roger Stone's all over. We've known Roger Stone, you and I, for 40 years. This guy is one of the sleaziest people in American politics and has totally. been forever. And you know one thing about Roger Stone? He cares only about Roger Stone. Yeah. And if he's up there under oath he, and he's in danger of going to jail for perjury, he'll throw anybody under the bus. If this thing turns out, turns to go bad. So I, I want to be sure I understand what you're saying is that you, you believe the Russian thing could be serious enough that it would lead to an impeachable offense. A- a- absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. I mean, if they have these intercepts, if they have and this is the, uh, the, <laughs> the newfangled version of the tapes with Richard Nixon. Yeah. Then then and it begins to go all the way to to uh, to the Oval Office door. Um, you know, or to Trump Clinton, Tower. Frank, well, yeah. Trump Tower, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I mean, in, in a sense, Trump by doing what he did last weekend about taping, tapping his phones, he's got. And this is a problem for him. I mean, this is a no win. Oh, no, this, this is a lose lose proposition. Absolutely. But I have always felt that this the, backfired on him in the sense that suddenly they say, "Well, if boy, if, if they if somebody was tapping his phones, then maybe there was a reason they were tapping his phones." Is the FBI investigating him? So suddenly right. the focus has come back on him, not on right. Obama, right. I think. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I you and know, I, I, I think this is so serious that, you know, look, we, we know that they tried to influence our elections, the Russians. We know what they did to do it. You know, they, they, you know, the leaks, none of the leaks came out of the Republican National Committee or Republican operatives or Republican folks and what they were doing. All of it came from the Democrats. Yeah. So, okay, fine. Then you find these, you know, Carter Page. Who's Carter Page? Why was he over there? Was, you know, who was paying him? And then there's, in other words, this to me has all the makings of a Watergate-style cover-up operation. Because what their, their only chance now is to try to put a lid on things. And that's what... That's what Trump and his folks have been I mean, trying it, to do. It, in many ways, it's worse than Watergate. Oh, sure, you say? because you know you've got a foreign power that you know that that is wreaking havoc around the world, who now is emboldened because they think they helped elect this guy, who they who they think is a kind of a goof, and and you know they think they can do what they want. So, you know, the Western Europeans are looking at this, going, mm, "Are we next? You know, is they going to come try to?" And and I think there's something about this, you know, you know, talking about make America great again, you know, putting America first. Excuse me, you know, you're in league with the Russians. Is this putting America first? I don't think so. I mean, that kind of thing. And and Republicans won't stand for that. I mean, they are traditionally uh, the most, you know, hawkish oh, oh, yeah. when oh, yeah. it comes to Russia. That's that, that's the thing to me is whether or not Russia actually was the difference in the election, which maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, right? But the fact that so many of these Trumpers 
are tied so closely to Russia. Right. That I think is the big issue. Right. Like wh- right. Wh- whether or not Russia did or didn't, we'll we'll find out. I, I do well, think we will find out. Well, but you know, people forget that Paul Manafort got fired when this yeah, stuff started right. getting sticky. Hello, uh, Paul Manafort. It was it was Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. He was partners with Roger Stone. These guys are thick as thieves. And you know, to me, it doesn't take a mental giant to begin connecting the dots. You know, is it possible that there's nothing there? That this is all just a uh, just smoke? I don't think well, so. But it, I just, guess it's possible. I mean, let's, let's <laughs> just let's, let's just back up to the facts, right? Donald Trump says, "I have no connections to Russia, and neither does anybody around me." All right? Okay. Right. That's that's a statement, all right? And now we know, I'm not sure I can even remember them all, right? But the people who have had real connections with Jeff Sessions, right. Jared Kushner, right. Rex Tillerson, you mentioned Carter Page, this is guy J.D. Gordon, yep. Roger Stone, right. Paul Manafort, that's right. seven. Yeah, that's just a start. Those, that's just those, a start, right? Those, those are the ones we know of, and every day and it Flynn. seems. And, oh, I'm sorry, let's add Michael Flynn. <laughs> There's eight. And, and his son. All right. Nine. <laughs> the Flynn yeah. family. Right. No, I mean, yeah. all, all these people, close right. top advisors to Trump, all of them, meetings with, conversations with Russians. And with Roger Stone, it was this guy, Guccifer II, yeah. who was the guy responsible for hacking the DNC. What the hell is Roger Stone right. doing talking about him? And let's also remember that before the first John Podesta emails came out, Roger Stone told reporters, you watch. In, in a, a few days, the, you're going to see. In a few days, he, you're gonna suddenly going to you're going to you're going to see. He's going to get caught. You're going exactly, and uh, so, so there's right. yeah. No, no, no. I, 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 I just it's just too much in the way of coincidences. There it seems no. to me. So there's been a lot of flurry of activity uh, in the last fifty days. I'm not sure how much has been accomplished, but the other thing is that no matter which poll you look at, and they may vary from 38 to 44. Right. Donald Trump's right. approval numbers are the lowest of any president. In, in, so everybody says, well, his base loves this. Yeah, but he hasn't really gone beyond his base yet, has he? No, that's the surprising thing. I mean, the I mean, numbers do this for a living. You're yeah, a yeah, I mean, these, these, these numbers, right? yeah, what is I mean, it? These what they numbers are, are terrible. I mean, if, if what you worry about in these kinds of situations is if all you can hold is that is that uh, those true believers – and and then you start losing some of this Republican uh, folks in Congress and around the country. Then you begin to lose your base. In other words, you, you know, even in these focus groups, Bill, of the, of, of the strong Trump supporters that, that Stan Greenberg just conducted, th- there still is a wait-and-see attitude for them. They say, you know, give the guy a chance. He's trying to you know, drain yeah, the swamp. Right. He's trying to do things that nobody's done. It's give him been, a chance. It's only well, been 50 days. you got to wait. Right. Yeah. But they're going to also be in that position of, of talking to their friends and relatives and, 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 and at the coffee shop in six months or a year. And they will. And this is what the Republicans worry about. Because if, this, uh, if, if they can't f- do their signature piece on affordable care mm-hmm. in this country, if they, if they, then they come to – they've got to go fairly quickly with a tax plan. They've got to do the big stuff. And that I agree. You know, if I were Bannon, you've you got to do big stuff. First of all, it's all you talked about in the campaign. Yeah. And then that begins to fall apart because basically then what you're saying is, you know, all you folks who want to give to charity, sorry, you're not going to get charitable deductions anymore. And you have universities and you have – uh, uh, homeless shelters going, hey, what the hell are you doing uh, d- d- to our income base here? Then you have folks who, are, who own their own home who have the mortgage interest deduction, and you're saying, oh, you know, that we're going to get rid of that too. And folks are saying, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Home ownership is kind of a key thing in our country. Really? You're going to do that? So this begins to go. And I'll tell you, if by the end of the year, and this is what Republicans know, if by the end of this year, early next, th- th- they're not going to be wanting to run with Trump, because his popularity right. is going to increase that no, much. You're right. But they want to run on issues. And we okay, we're in charge. We did this, and if they can't go in in 2018 to the to the electorate and say, you know, we did this, they're in deep trouble. I mean, you know, Daryl Issa 
is distancing. I mean, here's the guy who was there, you know, the, the lead, yeah. you know, a critic of, of, of the Clintons and, and, and a big Republican stalwart. Well, you know, a thousand votes or whatever the heck it was he won by. It, 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 a little cold water in the face. And he's the one who calls for a sta- special prosecutor. So he's just, but he knows that if he's going to go back and run for reelection there and they've done nothing, bye bye. Right. <laughs> I mean, how much it, money you got? Uh, historically, too. I mean, this is a time when the president's numbers ought to be a sort of a war, right. as high as they ever are, right? Because he's honeymoon. Coming in, he's heavy, new, yeah. yeah, right. We, we've we've always seen historically. Honeymoons. If they ever start this low, do they ever? I, I, go well, up? that's the problem. I don't. You know, since polling, the answer would be probably no. I mean, the only time I could think. I wonder about where Harry, of course, the polling was pretty bad then, as we know, oh. in 1948 with Harry Truman. Was there any you know, at all? Yeah, well, I remember I they know. polled and they said he was going to lose the election and he holds up, oh. you know, do yeah. what beats Truman. Yeah. But I don't know how his numbers started out after he won that election. But I, I mean, I, you, know, any, you always get a bump. You always get a bump. In fact, they used to take polls and they'd say, who did you vote for? <laughs> and everybody wants to be with a winner. So they'd always say, oh, you know, I yeah. voted for it. And of course, they hadn't. So, so um, yeah. I, uh, I'm not asking you about 2020 at all because I have a we have a rule on the show. Right? We do not <laughs> talk about 2020. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to I want to come back where we started uh, in the sense of the Democratic Party. Who would you say is the leader of the Democratic Party today, or is there one? Well, you know, again, Bill, you and I go back so darn far in this kind of stuff. And I remember these very same discussions, 1981, 82, when I was head of this group, Democrats for the 80s, Democrats in our 80s, I'm now saying, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, you know, we, 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 we were gathering at Pamela Harriman, Averill Harriman, Bill Clinton was on that board. You know, we were all these hand-wringing Democrats were coming up, and they were just like, there's nobody out there, there's nobody out there. Yeah. And, of course, there were a lot of people out there. There were a lot of voices. We did a lot of, of work. We won 26 uh, House seats in 1982 in that comeback year against Reagan and the Republicans. And and I think we got, you know, we, we, we need more talent. We need more younger talent. We need more people to get involved in politics, no question about it. But I think we've, you know, I think we've, we, we, you know, I, I don't I don't kvetch over that stuff very much. I really don't. I, I don't. Throw out a couple of names of rising young Democratic uh, stars. Look, I think Chris Van Hollen for here from Maryland is is a superstar. First of all, he's substantively unbelievably strong. He's great on budget issues. He's, you know, he's great on, 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 on uh on, yep. uh, infrastructure stuff and, uh, and the environment and Base. job creation. And he's politically savvy. Yeah. I mean, he's now the head of the Senate Campaign Committee, which is a tough lick. 25 right. seats you got to defend yeah. there. Yeah. You know, it's he, just, was, uh, he was sitting right in that chair last week. Here. Well, I, I like him a lot. I yeah. think he's got good political chops, and I think he's got good substantive chops. So I think he's good. Then you have some of the old pros. I think Dick Durbin from Illinois. I mean, uh, you know, he's an older guy, but he's been around. He knows how the system works. He's good. You know, Chuck Schumer loves the camera, but, you know, he's tough as nails. He'll be good. You know, I think, uh, you know, and then I think we got some of these younger stars that, that some of them ran for, for or thought about running for, for party chair out there. Pete, whose last name I can never pronounce, from Indiana. Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg, Who won the award named after my father at, at the Kennedy Library a few years ago. Great guy. And uh, Jason Cantor from, from Missouri. I think mm-hmm. that guy's not going. Mm-hmm. I think, look, you know, the best Kennedy out there I've seen in years since Ted is, is Joe. Mm. This guy yeah. is terrific. He chooses his battles. He's a nice, decent, yeah. honest guy. And he doesn't, he doesn't grandstand. But, boy, he took them on. Big time last week. I think yeah, it's interesting so. you mentioned a couple of people who aren't in office right now but who could be very soon. Because I think that the real leader of the Democratic Party probably isn't here yet. You know, and to, like to lead us into the next generation here. You got Schultz ahead of Starbucks. This guy is a really smart sure. guy. He's going to be coming. You know, the the head of Chibani Yogurt. This guy yeah. to me is a superstar. Sure. I mean, what an amazing person he is. Look at Bill. Look at how I excited Bill is. <laughs> I, I love this. I'll guy. send him a check. I just finished my morning yogurt. My morning Chobani. Morning Chibani. Okay. Every day. Okay. Every know, damn right. day. Now, he 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 has yeah, a big plant in Twin Falls, Idaho. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought? And this is, you know, he got a lot of lip. Other people, oh, yeah, you've got all those immigrants coming in. You know, they love this guy. Yeah. I mean, he has oh, revitalized yeah. the economy there. His employees love him. 
He's got a. It's you know this is a guy who runs a business. Right. This is a guy who's a business guy who knows what he's it's a doing. Real business Unlike man. Um, <laughs> right. a certain orange so, man. Right. So as we said, uh, a lot of focus has got to be and is on state legislatures and governors' races. Carolyn Fiddler. That's her job with the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. Joining our conversation with Peter Fenn here on the Bill Press Show this Monday, March 13. Hey, fans, what do you say? A little time out here to talk about free speech TV. Look at this. Headline, front page, New York Times. Liberals tune in to TV again in search of communal solace. Yes, indeed, it's happening. Uh, progressives, liberals around the country, they need they need to find the people who agree with them. They need to get the truth uh, instead of all the fake news coming out of the White House. And who are they turning to? They're turning to their liberal friends, progressive friends on television, to Rachel Maddow on uh, MSNBC and others there, to Bill Maher on HBO, to Stephen Colbert, to and uh, The Daily Show, yes, indeed, and to Free Speech TV, most of all, Free Speech TV. You can get one show occasionally on those other channels, but the only 24-7 progressive television channel in the entire country is right here on Free Speech TV with me and, uh, um, and you know Tom Hartman, Stephanie Miller, David Packman, all your other great hosts. So what's that mean? Now's the time to step up and support Free Speech TV, we ask you to do that several times a year. Now's the time again to keep this great team going. We'll give you the best progressive news and insights every single day, every single show. Uh, and we depend on you to stay on the air. It's as simple as that because we're so independent. We're so freewheeling. We don't get any government money. We don't get any corporate money, no Koch Brothers money. It all depends on you. And if you can help us, We'll send you a little token of our appreciation for 60 bucks, a free speech TV water bottle for a pledge of 120 bucks. This great new book called The Revolution Where You Live by Sarah Van Gelder, her stories of her travels across America. For a pledge of 150 bucks, a great new DVD on that standing rock uh, revolution uh, out there to stop that pipeline. For a pledge of 240, you get the DVD, the water bottle. A t free speech TV grocery bag and a bumper sticker for three hundred and sixty dollar pledge. That uh, the book Revolution Where You Live, the grocery bag, the t free speech TV hat, a hand fan, and a bumper sticker. The whole enchilada for a thousand bucks. Get yourself to Washington. Carol and I will take you out to dinner. Meet the whole team here and be part of the Bill Press Show. Make your pledge right now. Eight seven seven three seven eight eight six six nine. Caller standing, but uh, recep reception is standing by to take your calls. 877 378 8669. Or go online and make your pledge right now for Free Speech TV at freespeech.org. commentary the best clips from the show all in one place youtube.com slash the bill press show all right it's not snowing yet but <laughs> the blizzard headed our way we're told i don't believe it we'll find out what happens march madness indeed but uh, we're on the uh, political front not the weather front here on the bill press show good to see you this monday march 13 coming to you live from our nation's capital Washington, D.C., brought to you today in part by Amalgamated Bank. Yes, you want a bank with progressive values. You got it with Amalgamated Bank for almost a century now. They've been the premier bank of choice for progressive organizations and individuals nationwide, do a great job under President Keith Mestrich. And you, too, can be a progressive uh, banker 
Uh, go to amalgamatedbank.com. Anywhere in the country, sign up for Amalgamated Bank. Be a proud progressive at the same time. Uh, Peter Fenn's been with us as a Democratic strategist here. He is a Democratic strategist. Here is a friend of Bill uh, for so far for this hour, continuing. And we're joined by Carolyn Fiddler, who is the communications director for the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. Hello, Carolyn. Hello. Welcome to the uh, to the gang here. So uh, we were talking earlier and saying you were coming in so we could talk about uh, the focus on state legislative races and governor's races. Let's start on two important governor's races. New Jersey and Virginia? <laughs> um, Bingo, you win. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place to start. Since, yeah. they're, <laughs> since they're the two up this year, uh, what's going on? New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, a lot of strong candidates are coming out of the woodwork to uh, be the successor to Chris Christie. He's not popular. The Republican who runs uh, for that governorship is going to have a very hard time. It really period. breaks my heart to see I Chris know. Christie having a hard time. It's, Boy, do I hate that. It's but, but, he's, over. But, but he's out, right? I mean, he's, he's not running for yes, re-elector or can't or whatever. Okay. So do we know who the Democratic nominee is? Uh, not yet. Not yet. So, um, but in Virginia, uh, we have two great. Well, let's start. In, in, is it a primary state? So there will be a. Uh, I guess it must be. Peter. Well, it uh, most states, uh, the state party will determine uh, how the governor is nominated. Um, I'm not sure if New Jersey is doing a, a convention or a primary, but uh, probably a primary. Yeah, primary. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I'm not, I'm trying to. Yeah, you, it's early yet, anyhow. But yeah. uh, but certainly, and there are a lot of candidates. Mm-hmm. There, I mean, who are running? But they they look pretty strong, and the Republicans don't have any great hair hair appearance. And, 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 and in a sense, the Republican Party is going to be it's it's the legacy of Chris Christie that right, they'll be right. trying to avoid. I'm yeah. sure, right? right? Trying and, to run and, away you know, there from. Are only, I think there are only a, a couple of uh, Republican incumbent members of Congress that lost us time and. Scott Garrett up in uh, northern Jersey got beaten. Uh, so, uh, you know, th- th- there's there's movement there uh, for uh, uh, for the Democrats, I think. Josh Gottheimer beat Scott Garrett in, mm. in, a, in a close race, so that was good. Well, my suggestion uh, to uh, whoever turns out to be the Republican nominee, if there, if there are any uh, local mayors that don't endorse them, you know, they could, uh, <laughs> they could get even by maybe closing a couple of lanes on a bridge yeah. here or there. Or some yeah. traffic problems in Fort Lee, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And never gets old. Never, never gets, old. gets old. And there are a lot of bridges in New Jersey. A lot of bridges. <laughs> uh, Virginia. Oh, yes. Uh, two great Democratic candidates there. Uh, that will be determined by a primary. Uh, so will the Republican side. They usually do... Uh, um, conventions for the Republican nomination in Virginia, but this year they opted not to because conventions are how they got that crazy guy who was running for LG last time, E.W. Jackson. Yes, so. I was hoping that the name <laughs> E.W. Jackson would come up. I live to oh, serve. Yeah. yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah. There's some real kooks in Virginia, man. Ken Cuccinelli, E.W. Jackson. Mm-hmm. I mean, for as, for as blue as Virginia has gone in past presidential races, I mean, they really do have some... Uh, some goobers. Well, there. Virginia's a, <laughs> Virginia's a. I mean, it's almost night and day, yeah, right? Two states, two yeah. state, almost two states. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, on the Democratic side, so it, it, it's uh, Tom Periello, yes. who was a member of Congress uh, for a time at the Center for American State Department, Center for American mm-hmm. Progress, so State he was Department. Over there doing yeah, right. He's he's, uh, he's an African expert actually, but he's a tremendous guy too. I think both candidates are very strong, to be honest. They both have, uh, have. I mean, you know, Northam has the the downstate help that, as well as uh, the Northern Virginia that he brings. Perillo is a, you know, is more of a charismatic figure of, you know, kind of a fighter. But, he, but either one, I think, would be a strong candidate. Also, his for, district was a um, tough district. Tough district. Very, yes. I mean, it was not a blue district. No, the I fifth mean, was not a Democratic district. <laughs> so, is this a case in Virginia of? Um, is this a Bernie Hillary? Is is this a progressive? versus establishment race again? No. This is uh this is a progressive energy race. Yeah. This is uh this is uh Periello getting back into Virginia politics and saying I want to help make a difference. I hope it's just his uh first of uh, a longer career in Virginia politics for him. Uh but this primary is a great thing for Virginia Democrats. It's really going to help bring out that progressive energy that we're seeing and have already seen in uh state legislative elections in Connecticut and Delaware. And are seeing on the ground in uh, Georgia for that uh, the race to replace uh, Price. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. 
Uh, and there's a lot of money coming to these races. Yes. There's a lot of activism. You know, the hope in Virginia, and you're closer to this than I am, Colin, but, you know, you want to win some of those state legislative seats back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'd be kind of nice. You we know, have to, so yeah. many. We, recruiting has never been this good That's in really Virginia. Great. That's good, really good. great. So you mentioned Delaware. I want to go back. So as a native of Delaware, uh, that was sort of like the first big uh, Democratic slash progressive victory of the, of the season. A state senate race in Delaware, were you involved in that? Oh, deeply. Uh, DLCC was heavily involved. Uh, we were involved in the independent expenditure operation, uh, first state strong. And then on the uh, candidate hard side, we were... First state strong. Yes. I like that. <laughs> that's good. That's, uh, you're, you're, that's, you're really playing up for Bill here today. That's He's, Delaware. Look how excited he is. <laughs> first state. Uh, we, uh, we helped spearhead their field operation. I mean, there's a lot of uh, coverage of the massive volunteer effort that was up there. But without the infrastructure to deploy those volunteers, a lot of people would have been kind of just milling around. So we're really, really pleased about what we accomplished in Delaware. Well, this this was just, a, just if you will, a state Senate seat. But it did it, it determine the outcome or the um, control of the yes. state Senate in if, Delaware. If, right? uh, we had to win that race to keep the majority in the state Senate there, which meant keeping trifecta control of, uh, of state government in Delaware, all Democrats. And, and didn't you win it by double digits? I mean, it was a very yes. strong win. It yeah, was It was huge. Right. And, yeah. and the last race was very close for that. Season. All right, so, so that's a good sign, and that's one thing that Peter and I were talking about a little earlier. This has got to be the goal uh, to get trifecta in as many states as we can. What are the other targets? If you will? Uh, let's see: New York, uh, uh, Minnesota, Colorado, Washington State. Washington State is an interesting example because there is a special election there uh, on November seventh, the same day as the elections in Virginia and New Jersey, uh, for a seat that. Uh, if Democrats flip it, will give us a majority in the Washington State Senate. So that's very exciting. Right. New York, Minnesota, Colorado, Washington uh, State. I need a map. Uh, yeah. Colorado. New okay. Mexico, if you flip that governor's mansion. Right. Yeah. Uh, you did mention um, Georgia. Uh, I know this is not for con control of the legislation, but it's a, a key seat. It is. And it's, uh, a, it's Tom a, Price's seat. Yeah. In a, do you know that district? I don't know that district that well, to be honest with you. I think it's a, t I think it's a tough lift for the Democrats. I mean, I think you know <laughs> you? we're going to make yeah. an effort because there's not much going on, right? But uh, you know, you get close. I think. Look, Georgia. Everybody talked about during the presidential. Mm -hmm. If there's if there's some of these states that are going to move to the Democrats, Georgia's one. I mean, Texas is in play. Some of these places you wouldn't even think. You know, especially now with the throwing out their crazy redistricting mm -hmm. plan the Republicans put through. But, you know, if my numbers are right uh, uh, in the Texas thing, I think uh, Obama lost it by, what was it, 14 points, 16 points? And Hillary lost it by, like, six? I mean, uh, I mean... I don't and Democrats right. picked up five seats in the state house there last year. Yeah, see, I think this is... There are some places that, that now uh, are expanding our map. But we still, you know, you got to do Michigan. You know, come on. We win by less than two points in Minnesota and, uh, with Hillary. You got to do better there. They lost. They flipped the Senate, didn't they? They didn't do. State Senate is now Republican in Minnesota. Nah, come on, you, that shouldn't happen. How about Michigan? Michigan, I mean, uh, Democrats. I mean, that's a state that you we should, should get the governor's race. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and the legislature. I mean, Democrats have Michigan won. Michigan should be a trifecta state. Democrats seat. have won more votes for the state house there in the last three elections: 2012, 2014, and 2016, and have not won a majority in that chamber. Jeez. Yes. yes. That's a redistricting. Yeah. yeah that's right. Like that's just. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's so infuriating. Uh, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So Democrats getting more votes, but. Mm -hmm. Not picking up the seats because of because of redistricting. Ah, democracy. Yeah, we picked up seats, just uh, not mm -hmm. enough no. to flip, obviously. So right. Um, so Peter, part of the problem it seems to me is, and I say this as a former state Democratic chair in California, you know, it's it's easy to get people excited and write checks for the presidency. Right. 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 It's easy for them for right. for state U.S. Right. Senate. I mean, right. I've gone to so many fundraisers for the U.S. in California, right? They come in. Right. We, we always called ourselves the ATM of the party, yeah, right? Right, <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. Have a little fundraiser, right. roll up the check, and then that money leaves California. It's never spent in California. Right. And, and, and I, I was just speaking from, my, speaking from my experience in California. But then there are house races. 
But, boy, it's really tough to get people interested, isn't it? Sure, because no one's ever heard of these people, except in their little local State areas. State legislative but, races, but this, how exciting are look, they? Right? This is the job. They of, are very This exciting. is the job of Tom Perez. This is the job. You know, Barack Obama says he's going to get involved with this with you guys. And, you know, I, my sense of this is, and this is, you know, if you, at that, at that women's march, you know, when you listen to some of those speakers, they got it. Even, you know, Michael Moore was talking about running for school board as an 18-year-old kid. And, 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 and folks in that audience began to get the point. And, and this, you know, I, I, we've been involved with this a long time. I could always tell. We went to Indiana early, early <laughs> in the early days. We had a terrific group there to, for state senate and state house. I mean, boy, oh, boy, they brought in consultants, groups of us. We did their campaign plans. We did their media. If they didn't buy off, if they were buying uh, Emory boards and, and, and refrigerator magnets, they didn't get the money from the state. I mean, they were tough, tough, tough. North Carolina has been in the past pretty good on mm. this stuff, too. Mm-hmm. You need very strong state operations. And traditionally, I hate to say this, but the money would come from labor. And everybody say, oh, labor's going to take care. Well, labor didn't have enough money, first of all, to do what needed to be done. And the kinds of jobs now that your guys are doing are absolutely, in my view, critical because you, there's your bench. That you, everybody forgets redistricting comes from the state legislators, mm-hmm. not from Congress, yep. not from the Senate. You know, and you got to win those, you know, win those seats. So and you got to re- group, right? Recruit candidates. Absolutely, and you got to help them because these are most of these people are pretty green. They haven't run before. If they run, they run once. And you need folks that say, "Here's the kind of budget you need. Here's how much is going to go into communications. Here's how you waste money. You know, you get your brother-in-law to do X, Y, Z. I mean, you really have to professionalize these campaigns. California's got it into, you know, it's a science there. It's a whole different <laughs> ballgame. But, you know, when you're talking about some of them, especially we were talking about earlier in the Midwest, where we need to bulk up, you, you really need strong I mean, look at Look at Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown ran for, of course, he had the Brown name, right. Pat Brown, or so it was e- e- easier for him. But even he started at the community college board. Yeah, yeah. School board, community yeah. college board, city council, state well, legislature, and then work your way up. And uh, you know the other that's part of the this farm to me team is is this is where a lot of women start. Mm-hmm. Women don't start because they're friggin' senior class presidents in high school. Women start because they're involved in issues in their communities and and they're on the ground. They get it. And, you know, we, we've done a decent job, but not a great job, at getting more women to run for those state legislative offices. I think that's, you know, that, and, and especially the you know, Democratic women who can really make a difference. Uh, Leader Pelosi last week at the International Women's Day rally here in Washington uh, said it perfectly. I said, you know, you turned out the day to march to protest. Now you need to run to win. Yeah. Got to run. Got to run yeah. for office. Run there was a office. surge of candidates uh, who filed right after the Women's March, actually. Were um, there? Oh, that's yeah. awesome. In, uh, in, in Virginia. So it's having, I mean, it so has you a really very feeling, real impact. So you're feeling pretty good about Virginia. You think we got some really good candidates there. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's an old boys club. Holy cow. Especially those Republicans. It's, oh, my Lord. Oh. It's shifting. It's shifted a lot over the last decade and a half. I've, I've watched it personally yeah, up close. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so let's come back to the, the, redis- the next redistricting is in... 2021. 2021, Unless based the, on the 2020 um, elections. The 18 and, and 20, yeah. 18 and 20, right. right. And those who draw the districts in 2020 or 2021. That's right, those state right. legislators are the ones with the, the pens in their hands, so to speak. You know, as we were talking about, we were in fine shape in, in 2009, I mean, we had we. It's, it's a, a we had majorities image. in sixty chambers. Yeah, right. it was. Had, a flip. I'm sorry. We had majorities in sixty chambers in 2009, and then 2010 was it's flipped, and that's when they redistricted in 2011, and yep. we were screwed. I mean, a lot of states. So um, Karl Rove saw this, right. saw the importance of this. Right. Started this project called Red Map, as I recall. Right. right. Which, which, here he is in the White House. Planning this strategy to go after to right. flip state legislatures and governors right. across the country. Where were the Democrats asleep at the switch? Are, you were not there at the time. I'm not <laughs> blaming you, but even if you were, I will blame you. Well, it was. But I, I mean, mean, as a party collectively. Well, like you said, things looked good going into 2010 for Democrats everywhere. Democrats were were riding high, and then all of a sudden, everyone's house was on fire. Yeah. 
I, I will say this, and and you know, I you absolutely love Barack ball, Obama. Huh? I, I I think that he was an absolutely extraordinary president. I think that he was focusing on the right stuff, but he he did not have a political operation in the White House that really was focused on this or cared about it. Patrick Gaspard was put over there at the at the DNC early on in 2009-10. He was so frustrated, at least this is my understanding, that you know, and they got to be ambassadors to South Africa and he was a great ambassador to South mm-hmm. Africa. But I, I I think that 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 this was not a priority for this president and the people around him, to be honest. I mean that's my gen- when they asked him to do fundraising, he did it. He went all over the country, he helped raise money. But in terms, you know, look, you have presidents like Kennedy or Johnson in the old days, and even to an extent Bill Clinton, they took control of that DNC operation big time. He just said, okay, you guys go ahead and do your thing. Um, And I think then the threat, they didn't see the threat coming until the Tea Party stuff started rising up. And and then by the time you finish 2010, you're you're worried about re-election. Your numbers are tough. Your whole political operation in the White House is geared towards 2012, which is where it should have been geared to for that matter. But then you have a repeat of the damn thing in 2014 where we lose more seats. And so, I mean, I, I may be overly critical. I don't, what do you think? Or I don't think you're an accurate. Critical. I think that, I think that uh, there was not sufficient focus on these down-ballot races in 2010. Um, but like I said, everyone's house was on fire that year. Right. And right, right now, progressives have definitely shifted their focus right. towards these down-ballot state legislative res- races. And that's really, really exciting. And well, say what you want about Howard Dean, you know. He, his 50-state strategy was not a bad one. His notion that we're playing everywhere, that we're recruiting candidates everywhere, and that doesn't mean you put equal amounts of money everywhere. But, you know, to give everybody a buy-in, you know, that's, that's, that's what the Democratic Party should Look, be doing. Uh, uh, it was absolutely brilliant and essential and absolutely right on target as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yes, you've got to play in every one of the 50 states. As you say, it doesn't mean you send as much money to Nebraska Idaho. as you do. Yeah, right, or <laughs> Idaho, that, right, as you do My to, state. <laughs> <laughs> as you do to New Jersey or right. whatever. But, but, um, but still, you have to be out there recruiting teams, the same plan, recruiting right, teams, right, running right, candidates right. in every one of the 50 states with a strong state organization. And now, is the money coming to you? you? You're getting more money now from Actually, sources? Actually, yes. That's good. Our, our low-dollar uh, fundraising is, is off the charts for the first couple of months of this year. It's and and staffing, you're finding your we are, staffing? We are, we're up. bulking up. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to be That's at good. DLCC. People yep. care now. People, people want to get active. People want to give their yeah. time, their money to things that they believe in because we now know what happens if you don't. Right. You know? Right. right. We get Donald Trump as president. Right. And the Koch brothers and Alec and those folks have been doing this stuff forever, the Heritage Pack. I mean, totally, you know, it's totally. like they took a little bit of a page out of our book 25 years ago, but, you know, we got, we got a little lazy. Yeah. So that's no. the good news. Absolutely. We're, and the focus. We're not lazy anymore. I think no. we're back. I think we're back. By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, Uh-oh. but Uh-oh. Donald, Donald Trump, Trump did been... tweet this Uh-oh. morning. Oh, I oh, okay. oh I've got one. it too. Okay. I feel like yeah. I should probably read this one because it is. This uh, is a Bill Press uh, show breaking news. Oh, breaking oh, news I get so excited when we have breaking yeah. news. Yeah. From yeah. Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, quote, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to read this. It is amazing how rude much of the media is to my very hardworking representatives. Be nice. You will do much better. End quote. Oh, yeah. Um, this is the man huh? who... Huh? huh? This, this is the man who is known for being nice. Nice, to yeah. People. Nice is his middle yeah. name, isn't Lion, it, Donald? Lion, nice. Ted, <laughs> yeah. Crooked Hillary, Little Marco. <laughs> Uh, if, if we're not of jokes. I don't have any more. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, couple things. Like, couple, couple, couple things. Really, really. Yeah, right. So, first of all, he complained about people being too rude. Right. Then he talks about my very hardworking representatives. But well, 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 I, that's why I want to stop you. Who's he talking about? Yeah, I don't know. Like Kellyanne. Yeah, Kellyanne. Like she was just on CNN. Maybe, no, 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 maybe they not, were mean to he her. He's not talking about Congress because it's a small R. He's right. talking about oh, my. Oh, yeah, he would never misspell that. No, but he's talking <laughs> about my. So I think he's talking about his yeah, White his House. People, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. No, I, th- so I think we're, it's we're too a well-oiled mean. machine over there. I mean, yeah, clearly. <laughs> here's, here's, here's the, we're here's too the deal. Mean to, we're too mean to Sean Spicer? Hey, guys, I guess. Guys, 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 <laughs> look, 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 look. What's happening today? 
right? What's happening today? The CBO is coming out with his report. Yeah. What does he want to do? Distract. He wants you know, absolutely. He'll be tweeting mm-hmm. all morning about crap. And and in order for folks cover that instead of covering the fact that we're going to lose whatever ten to fifteen million people off of the Affordable Care Act, be Come nice. On. Yeah, be nice. He says, be nice. Yeah. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. boy, pot meat kettle. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, this is my uh, my goal for today: is to be, be nice. Be nice. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to the briefing t- uh, today. Okay. So, uh, oh, they're going to invite you in again. Uh, they can let you. That's yeah, right. Yeah. No, they haven't. They haven't taken away my hard pass. <laughs> Ooh, yes. 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 Um, so I think I'll, we just fixed I know. that. <laughs> I'll make a special point when I get there today. I'll say, hi, hi Sean. Hi, well, you? Well, you look so nice today, <laughs> Sean. I like your suit and your <laughs> new tie. Is it, is it a Trump tie? Don't be rude. <laughs> is you it know. made in China? Just don't be rude. Oh, whoops. <laughs> just don't be rude. <laughs> you know, he's, he's going to get a lot of crap today. Uh, uh, Good. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, is this a big year or is it 2018? It's really 2018, right? I mean, all years are big years. I mean, every year is an election year for us, and Virginia is a big deal. But I mean, so two governorships up this year. Right. But next year's, like. That's that's, uh, that's pro-level ball. What, do you remember how many? Oh, first? gosh. 36 how, governors up uh, next 34 year. next oh, year. 34. 36, two, excuse me, two. Yeah, that's right. right. And two, today, two yeah. this, and then and 30. 34. Mm-hmm. 34 governors. Yes. That's a lot. A lot of, a lot of open yeah. seats, a lot of open Republican seats. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a big... Peter, we're going to need you absolutely full bore, full time. Okay. <laughs> I'm not getting too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can retire 2019. Okay, I'm right. for that. Yeah, All right. No. Carolyn Fitter, thanks so much for joining us. DLCC.org and Peter Fenn. FenDaily.com. Oh, wow. Oh, my little... Thanks, guys. Thanks this is Thank the Bill Press Show.